Mary Lynn Robinson is a wonderful American author, and she won a Pulitzer for her novel, Gilead. And the book is formatted as a letter. It's a diary of entries of sorts. It's written by John Ames, who is a dying minister, and it's intended for his young son to read as he grows older. And in many of those entries, John writes about a member of their church, Jack Bowden. Jack is a prodigal son of sorts, thoughtful, brilliant, son of a minister, but a bit of a rebel. Moved out of the town, but came back, tumultuous relationship with the church, but nevertheless, he keeps some sort of a relationship invigorating and exhausting all at the same time with John Ames, the pastor. And in one of their conversations, Jack is wrestling with the idea of predestination, and after going back and forth with John on the topic, John doesn't know what else to say. And John says, of course, fictional character in one of his entries, he said, There was an uneasy silence, so I remarked that he might find Carl Bart a help just for the sake of conversation. Jack said, is that what you do when a tormented soul arrives on your doorstep at midnight? Recommend Carl Bart? In my first ever seminary class, The life and work of the pastor, 8 a.m. Tuesday morning, first class ever, we read Gilead. And this excerpt came up in one of our discussions. And the issue that it raised for us was trying to pastorally care through secondhand means, through this person's book, or that person's quote, or this person's thoughts. The sorts of things young seminarians think everyone cares about. And the insufficiency of that. With the point being that when you're meeting with someone, what they care about is you. You're their pastor, not some author or, frankly, anyone else. And the point was, so be their pastor. But it raises even a broader issue for any Christian. And one we've thought about before from a different angle. And that is, what do I have to give others of God's work in me? Is the capacity of God's work in me sufficient for anyone else? If a tormented soul arrived on the proverbial doorstep at midnight for you, The question from your child, the question from a grandchild, the question from another family member, question from your co-worker, your friend, the person done with church and everything of the like. And they're not interested in second-hand solutions. They're not interested in coming to church with you. They're not interested in reading a book you read. They're not interested in listening to something you heard. They're not interested in your pastor. Their limited interest is confined to you. And whether or not they would even think about it this way, God's work in you. Is there enough there to give them? Will you stand with me as we read this morning? Acts chapter 19, verses 11 to 20. It's a holy sound. You always can tell Bible pages turning. Pick up in verse 11, Acts chapter 19. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. 
Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. A pretty incredible passage considering all that takes place in it. And the primary emphasis of the passage really are the first two words. And God. God and God's power is what is being highlighted. And in this remarkable variety of ways. First, in this specific way to Paul. Miracles, healings, and even exorcisms are happening through the distribution of different cloths, handkerchiefs, aprons, these easily portable cloth pieces. And it's important to note, there is no parallel here to the cheap, blasphemous imitations of televangelists sending handkerchiefs to people that have uh, allegedly been blessed to people for money. So there's no call line for people to donate to Paul's ministry. He isn't asking for seed money. He isn't working up some emotional appeal with soft music in the background. And he most certainly isn't selling and attempting to commodify the power of God to innocent people in need. So that that sham on television has utilized familiar elements to this story is shameful, but that modern nonsense has no basis in this text. And a few things to keep in mind about it. Most importantly, again, it's God's work. Verse 11 begins, and God was doing. One scholar suggested that this was this distribution. Why would God do this particular thing through Paul? One scholar suggests that this was the best way to bring the healing power of God to the sick in the widest possible way. As opposed to the difficulty or outright impossibility of the sick coming to Paul. This is a way to distribute in some way God through Paul to them. It was a way for him and the Lord to go to the sick through the distribution of these items. And this practice would have been in direct contrast to the very common trade of Artemis, Artemis, who just an idol, pagan uh, mythological god, the very common trade of Artemis idols. People were buying these little idols and bringing them to their, in their home in some hope for power or protection or prosperity. And that idol trade was a lucrative money-making opportunity for those who were fashioning and making the idols. So on the one hand, you've got this commodity of idols, which people are buying and hoping they do something, and shocker, they do nothing. Whereas for Paul, who's taking no money... There are these simple articles, these cloth articles, you know, not exactly in need of a blacksmith or silversmith to take an apron or a handkerchief. Basic, ordinary cloth just being given away and actually healing people, delivering people of evil spirits. So it's just one more example of the superiority of God over all else. 
especially over these empty sham idols and the market that was around them. So God's power is being shown through this particular practice. And it's also shown after the incident of these sons of Sceva, which we'll look in more detail in a bit. And that wild incident ends the way that it does in verse 16. They fled, talking about these brothers, they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And verse 17, incredibly, this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear of Uh, fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. So that crazy ordeal and God's power is still being made manifest in the lives of those who responded positively to Jesus, even despite all that wild incident. And it's not done. Verse 18 indicates that in the midst of all these people, uh, there were some who became Believers, God's power resulting in salvation. And among some of those new believers, it says, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And those practices end up having to do with paganism and things in the occult, and they burn all of these items, books, items, you name it. And what seems like almost a throwaway line for modern ears At the end of verse 19, it says, And they counted the value of them and found that it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Well, 50,000 pieces of silver was the equivalent of the yearly wages of 137 people. So it would be like burning a pile of stuff now in Hickory, North Carolina in 2021 that equaled a value of $3.5 million. Burning it. Not reselling, not trading, not repurposing, not even getting paid to dump it at the landfill. Burn it. Three and a half million dollars of stuff. So that's some serious repentance that led people to do that. And out of God's power bringing about salvation and repentance in this way, verse 20 The word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So, the power of God is being realized in the way of healing, in deliverance, in salvation, in repentance, and the furtherance of his word. And important to note is that that realization of God's power in those varied ways are not just some sort of spontaneous combustion and it's not just like poof and God does something out of thin air his power is being made manifest in these ways through people in and through their lives so verse 11 and God was doing extraordinary miracles and in some ways you could put the period there but the period's not there and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul Through Paul, through the residents who extolled the name of Jesus following the failed exorcism, through the people coming to salvation, through the new believers led to repentance and some serious commitment to ridding themselves of idolatry, and through the lives of those who were impacted by the increase and furtherance of God's word. The only negative example in this entire passage The only thing that goes wrong in the midst of so many things going right for the Lord is this failed exorcism by the sons of Sceva. Verse 14, Sceva was apparently a Jewish high priest and seven sons of his itinerant Jewish exorcists, so apparently they traveled around doing this sort of thing, they they try out their little gig on a particular man and what's the line that they try to use on an evil spirit I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims second hand faith 
Not by the Jesus they know. Not by just Jesus, period. Not by the Jesus in their life. Not by the Jesus they proclaim. But by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. And it's not like this sort of deliverance wasn't happening. Just one verse earlier, Luke is specific to mention that these ordinary cloths of Paul, handkerchiefs and aprons, things of that sort, God is using them to heal others. And then at the end of verse 12, their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. So people are being delivered by God through Paul in the name of Jesus by simple pieces of cloth. So it's not like God can't do it. It's not like God, through people, can't do it. But these brothers try to do the same thing, and the result, verse 15, But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered them all, and overpowered them. There were seven of them, by the way, one on seven, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. What was different? They were trying to live out of second-hand power. Second-hand faith. This wasn't God's power through them. This was some form of, at best, imitation, and at worst, some form of almost theft. Trying to claim something as your own and wield it by way of someone else. The Jesus whom Paul proclaims. That's an insufficient phrase. I don't suspect many of you in your lifetime will be an itinerant exorcist and attempt what these brothers did. And because of the specifics of this example, we're quick to go, whoo, bet those boys learned their lesson, and then just, and that's it, and then just move on. You know, I would never attempt such a thing, so it must not have anything to say to my life. But zoom out from the specifics. What's happening more broadly? What goes well in this passage are genuine to the person workings of God. And that looks differently depending on the person. For Paul, it looked like those, these instances of healing and deliverance. For others, it was salvation in their life. For others, it was repentance. For others, it was a radical commitment to cleaning out their closet, so to speak. Getting rid of things in their life that hindered and conflicted with life in Jesus. What doesn't go well are people trying to live out of God's power in someone else. Like riding the coattails of the faith of your spouse. Or propping yourself up by the collective faith of your church or your Bible study class. Or feeling beholden to what others think your faith is. What your children think your faith is. And you're really just managing an image. And you're trying to measure up to that. Now, each of those examples is deserving of more thought and empathy and discussion. But the point is that in those examples, that's trying to live by the Jesus whom my spouse proclaims. The Jesus my church proclaims. The Jesus my friends proclaim. The Jesus others think I proclaim. And none of those and other examples we could list are genuine to the Jesus you actually proclaim. 
The Jesus who your life proclaims. God's genuine work in your life. Now let me be clear. There are times in our lives where we desperately need the faith of our spouse, the faith of our church, the faith of our friends. There's plenty of Bible that speaks directly to that. And thank God for it. Thank God that we're not alone and that it's not totally up to us and that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who have words and faith and prayer when we have none. And there are times when that should be the emphasis. But texts like these give us the opportunity for another emphasis. They remind us that there are also times where we need to look in the mirror and do a sober assessment of what is God's work in my life. Who is the Jesus who I proclaim? The Jesus my life actually proclaims. And am I living out of that? And what is there to live out of? Now, in that question is both challenge and comfort. Challenge in that if you're like me, there's room to grow. The capacity of my life with Jesus could be deeper. And that's not God's fault, and it's not the circumstances of life's fault. I could be more intentional in a greater portion of my life being spent with Jesus, where the daily demands of life, or excuse me, yeah, where the daily demands of life are scheduled around that and not the other way around. Where you look in between your to-do list for the day and you go, okay, where am I going to stick Jesus? No, here's where, the t- here's where time with Jesus is going and everything else can adjust accordingly. Because it's His power and love and grace and mercy and peace and wisdom we so desperately need to live out of. Not our own or the lack thereof, peace and love and grace and mercy and wisdom and power. That's insufficient. It's insufficient for me and insufficient for you. But His grace is sufficient. And we can't explore this fully this morning, but a word on spending time with the Lord. It's easy to get tunnel visioned on what what does the practice needs to be? What's the thing that I need to do? And it's whether it's reading the Bible, praying, silence, meditation, fasting, fasting, all this, by the way, all practices that Jesus practiced and all helpful practices. But the point in those and in any practice is never just the practice. The point is that they are intentional times spent with Jesus. That's the point. They are intentional. They are spaces of sorts. Whether it is scripture or prayer or walking or running or exercising or silence or cooking. Whatever it is that Jesus is leading you to do. It's a space created with Jesus so that he can shape and form us that we may behold and become more like him. So as you ask the Lord, Jesus, what would grow my capacity with you? What would strengthen our relationship? What would equip my life more greatly with your life? What would deepen the well of life and power and love and grace and peace and wisdom with you with which I might live out of? Don't get hung up on the thing, on the practice. The practice matters, but there's not necessarily some intrinsic magic to the practice. The reward is what the practice facilitates, which is intentional time with Jesus. Again, that may be the usual places to start. Maybe it is. Maybe what the Lord will lead you in, more consistent time in prayer, consistent scripture reading, a new devotional. It may also be running. Maybe walking. It may be, hey, why don't you do this? Just wake up 20 minutes earlier. Spend it in silence with me. Sit outside. Cook a meal. Work on a project you've been meaning to get to. Ask the Lord, I want to spend better time with you, more intentional time. I want my life to better 
reflect you, what will help me do so? Listen for an answer and do so, and do it with Jesus. That's the challenge, that we have not arrived, per se. That we can grow in depth and intimacy with Jesus so that our lives are lived out of his power. And the Jesus our life proclaims is worthy of the Jesus who's Lord of the universe. The comfort is that though indeed we all have room to grow, that fact is not mutually exclusive to the truth that God profoundly loves you. You. Not who you think you should be, not who you could be if you were trying harder. You with all your faults and foibles sitting in that pew right now. God knows everything about you in your life. Everything you're proud of and everything you're not. And His word for you is unchanging. I love you. You are, as Psalm 139 beautifully attests to, fearfully and wonderfully made. You are sent with Jesus to the places He has put you, among the people He has surrounded you, with the gifts that He's given you, for the purposes He has for you. You are sent with Jesus to those places, among those people, with those gifts, for those purposes, as someone fearfully and wonderfully made. David writes earlier in Psalm 139, Your frame was not hidden from Him as you were made intricately woven in the depths of the earth. He writes earlier in verse 5, You, God, hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. David is... David, by the way, not a rosy past. He had plenty of room to grow as well. And yet this is... He's writing God's word to him and God's word to you. And he's straining at the limits of language to describe the tenderness and comprehensiveness and all surrounding love and presence of the Lord in his life and your life. A love and tenderness and all surrounding presence from before you were ever born. It preceded your existence. It is a love and tenderness you cannot fathom that formed you. And it's that fact of God's incomprehensible, unable to put it adequately into language, love for you, of His yearning for you to flourish, of His desire, which far exceeds your own, for you to be most fully empowered by His Spirit and live out of His power. I mean, ask yourself, parents, grandparents, who wants your children to flourish more, them or you? I bet it's you, and it same goes for your heavenly Father. And it's that fact that should compel us to respond to that love with a commitment to doing whatever is necessary to deepening and strengthening our, as Baptists love to say, our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I've told you all before... Uh, about the time in Houston, this was years before you knew about me and I knew about you, somewhere in thinking and praying about what was to be next, Laura and I didn't know. And I vividly, I, I remember exactly where I was driving when it happened, and I don't know precisely what caused it, but I sort of wondered in prayer about the full responsibilities of pastoring. And I sort of wondered, so I don't know, I, is in my head, is it out loud? Uh, I don't know. But I wondered, can, can I even do this? And God's answer was clear and simple. As our pastor in Houston would say, it was not audible, it was louder. And his answer was no. But I can 
living and growing into both parts of that answer. No, but I can. Is the challenge and comfort. I don't know where in your life God's answer is no, but I can. But that my own strength or your own strength or like those brothers trying to live out of someone else's strength, that's insufficient. God's word to that is no. It ends poorly for those brothers. It will end poorly for you and me. But I can. God's work in you in genuine you. There's no comparison. It, it may not look like someone else's. In you. Empowering and shaping and molding you. The you he made. The you he loves. The you he yearns to use in fullness. You and his grace in you is sufficient. So to the original question. To the troubled souls in need of the Lord in your life, is there enough there to give them? And might I mention, those troubled souls, it may be someone else, like it was in Gilead. That troubled soul may be your own. You may wonder, forget, is there enough between me and the Lord to give to someone else? Is there enough just for me? Whether it's others or you, it's the same answer. Just you? No. Christ in you? Oh, yes. Yes.